know that the Earth has two poles that are very cold, and that both the southern and northern hemispheres have deserts that are very hot. We know that the Earth's surface is twice as much ocean as land, and what you may not know is that 40% of that ocean consists of desert-like areas centered in mid-ocean basins known as subtropical gyres. Now these subtropical deserts of the sea are poor in fish resources and get very little traffic. They have no citizens, no constituents, no political parties, and very few users. Ships pass through them infrequently, and there is no incentive to exploit their scant resources. Nevertheless, they are home to many juveniles of the deep. Baby sea turtles go there to mature, as well as baby fish. I call these areas King Neptune's Desert Nurseries. Now, the North Pacific subtropical gyre that I study is the size of the United States, yet very little is known about it since it is remote from mainland access. Of all the 7.3 billion people on the planet, I believe I am the only one who has returned there again and again and again to study and sample it over many years. I have been there 10 times, far from the sight of land. I have drifted there for days, learning to appreciate the habitat and its creatures. It is well known that currents converge in these gyres, but only recently have we realized that these currents bring trash and become repositories for persistent plastics that symbolize the wasteful, ruinous productivity of our peaking capitalist civilization. The reckless speed with which the modern economy has embraced throwaway plastic products and packaging has resulted in the proliferation of a material capable of creating a permanent, ugly, devastating blight, unlike anything in the history of the Earth's oceans. Plastic, like diamonds, are forever. It is then eaten by nearly all sea creatures, and instead of providing nutrients, it transmits poisonous toxicants and false feelings of satiation to the animals it fools. Plastic pollution science is in its infancy, but it has reached already alarming conclusions. Number one, on average, eight million tons of plastic waste enter the ocean each year, Add another eight tons more for each succeeding year so that by 2025, 80 million tons will be added to the ocean yearly, creating an ocean one-fourth plastic, three-fourths fish by weight. 25 years later, in 2050, the ratio of fish to plastic is predicted to be half and half. Number two, hundreds of thousands of marine animals die each year tangled in plastic. Number three, fish we eat, along with bivalves like mussels and oysters, contain plastic. The average European shellfish consumer eats 11,000 pieces of plastic a year. Number four, chemicals and plastics can change the sexual nature of animals and act like natural hormone. Number five, vagrant plastic trash destroys the pleasure humans experience in natural settings and delivers the ultimate insult to our ocean planet and even the space around it by making much of it ugly and dangerous. Let me take you with me to view as I have the relentless despoilment of our ocean mother in her remote desert nursery. This is a compilation of several voyages to the North Pacific. Uh, our last one was in 2014. Our first one was in 1997 worldwide phenomenon, uh, the oceans are all connected. There's truly only one world ocean, and everywhere in it, we're seeing this same phenomenon, uh, an accumulation of our plastic trash. This is the area that we study, and the only organization that's actually done monitoring. There's 11 stations within inside this square here, and We've gone back time after time to monitor those 11 stations. So we actually have data over time from the same part of the ocean. So we've done these voyages uh, in 1999, 2000, 
2002, 2005, 2007, 2008, and now in 2009. Uh, the vessel we used was built uh, from scratch, uh, designed for this type of research. It's got a gantry that can deploy this uh, trawl unit off the back. We call it a manta trawl. It captures everything on the surface like uh, as if a manta ray were skimming the surface. It has a big wide mouth and a, a third of a millimeter mesh net designed to catch zooplankton. Example, it's a bucket that was uh, obviously used as a water retrieving bucket off a boat and it got away from the person that was either retrieving water or it snapped or something and broke and so it broke. It was accident. Nobody meant to throw this away. But this bucket goes along and, and slowly begins to break apart and it breaks apart starting with big chunks and then it breaks up into smaller pieces. In the sun it becomes very, so I can show you, the result of the sun and the salt water, very brittle, very brittle. It breaks very, very easy, so it breaks up into little, little pieces. The larger pieces, um, they tend to get fouled up by a lot of marine organisms, uh, barnacles, pelagic crabs, things like that. Uh, which some people could say, well, it's giving a uh, habitat a place to live. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily want marine organisms growing on something that is unknown as to whether it releases toxins into the water. And quite honestly, plastic, it's not been determined yet if plastics release toxins into the water. Uh, I really don't want to assume no. So anyways, it breaks into smaller pieces, and then from there, uh, the pieces just get smaller and smaller and smaller until you get pieces like this. And this is the kind of piece that will be ingested by a fish or a bird or something thinking it's food. Because this is now getting down to the size of things that are normally in the ocean that are normally eaten. Algalita scientists have recently published the results of a study of 671 lanternfish night feeders at the surface that are the most common fish in the Central Pacific. These lanternfish engage in the largest daily migration of life on Earth, and they're 55% of fish biomass. They're the feeder fish for all the other organisms in the ocean. They come to the surface to feed on the primary productivity that occurs at the surface with the plant material being eaten by the animal material. Then they feed on the zooplankton. And that plastic that's floating up there, those chips those guys are talking about, that's all mixed in with this phytoplankton and zooplankton. And, and uh, it begins to resemble food. And, and they're feeding at night. So they have tremendous load of plastic in their stomachs. 35% were found to have ingested plastic particles. And some had large numbers of plastic chips in their stomachs. These fish, in turn, are eaten by seals, dolphins, tunas and mahi-mahi, thereby transferring their pollutant load. This is some that came out, it was in here. Would you like to go ahead and put the, can I have the forceps? A good size one here. I could use this guy. They're not bad size. This is an interesting sample, as we have uh, oyster uh, spacers from the oyster aquaculture industry. We have two oyster spacers in here. We have bottle caps, no recycling for bottle caps. Uh, we have a big chunk of foam plastic. 
hard plastic foam and broken down fragments and nurdles. There's no question here but that the weight of the plastic is greater than the weight of the sea life. It's just obvious. Don't, don't, need, a, don't need a scale to tell you that. So here's the Laysan albatross. This is the vulture of the deep, the scavenger. That is the stomach contents of a four-month-old Laysan albatross chick. Just look at the number of bottle caps in here. Red bottle caps because they resemble the squid. This is foam plastic from insulation, fishing line, cigarette lighters. These are big birds. These are the biggest condors. They have, you know, over a six-foot wingspan. Uh, and their chicks can hold a lot of trash. But you can imagine the satiation reflex kicking in. That's a, a baby bird, a four-month-old bird sitting on the nest. Can you imagine what that will do to this population of birds as this continues to be fed to those chicks. Hundreds of thousands of them dying with full stomachs every year. There you can see another bird. Lighters, bottle caps. Mostly bottle caps. Bird after bird after bird, full of trash. I am standing on High Zex Buoy Island. These Hyzex buoys, these large black buoys, were released by the Japanese tsunami on March 11, 2011, and came as part of an array that was used in oyster aquaculture. Each buoy has a rope on it with scallop shells woven into the rope for oyster spat to recruit to and grow on. Um, this oyster farming operation was wrecked including the anchoring structure, and drifted out here into the Central Pacific, forming an island. And it gathers all the kinds of things that we find in our trawls and in our surveys, such as these uh, traps for eels. These are one of the most common debris items that we find out here. A lot of bait traps in the fishing industry, but we also find consumer goods as well. And there's cups, like this, there's lids of trash cans, like this. Uh, it uh, is matted rope that is catching a lot of plastic fragments. If you can see right down here, there's a tremendous number of these small plastic fragments that litter the beaches in Hawaii. These fragments have been caught by this island and serves as a beach out here in the middle of the garbage patch collecting the garbage. It continues to collect more and more stuff. We do not have the technology or the wherewithal to tow it away or dismantle it and take it away. We're a small research vessel, so this will have to remain here when we leave. All right, I'm currently standing on the highest part of this island, which is actually elevated about a meter above sea level. So we actually do have a mountain of sorts right here on the island, uh, something unique in uh, marine debris and uh, trash islands in the Pacific. Usually they're just ghost nets that are floating at the surface. Here we have enough structure and semblance of permanence to create actual hills on this floating pelagic plastic island in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean. The first pelagic plastic island ever discovered in the North Pacific gyre. What my, the point I wanted to make for the camera and the audience and anyone who cares to listen is that my experience of the gyre has been always sporadic debris and then accumulations in windrows. And we experienced that a couple days back. We were in a windrow and we experienced a lot of debris. We left the windrow and now a couple days later we're sailing, sailing, sailing on a random course and it's constantly like being in that windrow. It's just enormous amounts of debris passing the boat all the time. I've never seen anything like it. It's terrible and terrifying and revealing all at the same time. So this is what it looks like when we say a windrow of trash. This is what it looks like when you're swimming. You want to take your dive club out there, have a little recreational dive. We can give you hundreds of miles of this type of an experience out there. 
Uh, people want to clean it up, but when you realize the spatial extent, uh, you realize uh, what a daunting task that would be. Uh, we can't even clean up our coastline. This is uh, just millions of square miles. This is a, just an enormous area to try to clean up. I'm going to uh, just talk to you now about some of the conclusions I think that uh, we can draw from this and some of the ways it relates to zero waste as I wrap up here. Now, science has facilitated amazing technological innovation, yet for all its power over nature and its clear understanding of planetary scale harmful consequences, scientific knowledge has been unable to produce the changes known to be necessary to reverse the bad consequences of plastic facilitated economic growth. Knowledge of what is wrong with our production and use of plastics will not be able to drive the revolutionary changes needed to the technical apparatus that pollutes the planet and fuels the world's peaking economic system. And let's not forget that the latest market being conquered so conspicuously by the pharmaceutical industry, the human body itself. In a global economy where life is directed from childhood toward competing in the disappearing job market in order to afford commodities, political will to act in people's own best interest and that of the planet that sustains them is blunted by an artificially maintained, totally busy connectedness which has so far failed to mobilize the enormous numbers needed for the first ever world historical revolution. But people are talking, a new theme song is being sung, and it rhymes with hero. There are a number of reasons why the zero waste movement can be the needed long-term driver of radical change. Number one is that we cannot get to zero waste at the societal level within the status quo. Planned obsolescence and conspicuous consumption driven by a deceitful advertising behemoth that now insinuates itself into our most intimate thoughts and conversations and even our bodies drive the production of waste for economic growth and increased profits. The zero waste movement will always have to struggle to keep pace with waste generated by the demands of a competitive marketplace. And don't forget that the millions of refugees from senseless wars are by definition unemployed. Since unemployment doesn't affect productivity, the vast numbers of people on the run and out of work does not affect the major markets. There are still plenty of goods to be purchased and disposed of. The zero waste movement must focus on both types of resource recovery, although recovering human resources is more difficult and more political. Zero waste cannot be the revolutionary vanguard if it is willing to accept maximum toil for minimum wage in the interest of the smallest of all social groups, the barons of industry and the manipulators of the marketplace. Zero waste proponents have been able to build a mass movement joined by large corporations because they show them that they can create jobs and save money within the existing apparatus. I believe that a steady increase in the quantity of zero waste case studies and successful applications must eventually lead to a qualitative change in the way society is organized. If there is anything that the proponents of zero waste know, it is that there are plenty of resources to go around. Only when we eliminate the concept of waste can we restore the natural world and rebuild our own urban habitats that have suffered so long under the pressures of rapid industrialization. We have the entire world to organize and radically change. And yes, it will take a movement of political revolutionaries who demand zero waste now and for all future generations. But no matter where you find yourself today, you have a role to play in creating zero waste communities. I can tell you, as perhaps the only representative of a part of our planet the size of a continent 
in the middle of the ocean that you are my only hope. The righteousness of your cause is indisputable, and the suffering millions of sea creatures cannot wait for you to cross the finish line in your race to zero. As their representative, I pledge to you my continued admiration and support. Let us conclude with the chant I heard so often in my zero waste dream team tour of Italy. Refute di zero! Refute di zero! Now, this is the time when usually you make a pitch for come out and buy my book, support Algolita Marine Research. But we do things a little differently. I've got a check here for the Albatross Coalition. For Ruth, could you come up here from uh, the Will J. Reed Foundation, who I sit on the board of, and I have a convinced to give seed money of $5,000 to the Albatross Coalition. <laughs> and the Grassroots Recycling Network, yay! All right.